Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, August 31st, 2021 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. When you're dealing with a cryptocurrency, of course, the important part is that your wallet is identified by a public-private key pair. The public key is what you may give to others so they can send you money. The private key, of course, you want to keep a secret. The problem with this is that these are long random strings by design, so they're usually not easily typed or remembered. And as a user, of course, you have to absolutely absolutely make sure to get these keys right. So what are you going to do? You're going to copy paste them. In the past, this has been attacked several times. For example, there has been malware that automatically swapped a public key for the attacker's key in order to essentially have the money then being transferred to the attacker. But more recently, an other attack is just monitor the keyboard for possible private keys and then outright stole them. Now, Xavier ran into a, a Python script that did implement the swapping technique. And what was sort of interesting here is that it was kind of obfuscated by inserting as every second line a comment, which was a love related poem from various authors. Not sure how successful this is for obfuscation, uh, given that the comments, of course, are easily removed automatically, but maybe it will fool some simple signature based analysis. And just happens that Brian Grebs actually did a report about such an incident that happened back in 2018 and is now hitting the courts in the victim suing the parents of the thief for compensation for 16 bitcoins that were stolen back then. And yes, we do have a new exchange vulnerability, but luckily it's just new in the sense that it was disclosed now. It was patched back in April. So hopefully you don't have to worry about this vulnerability too much, but exploitation of this vulnerability is trivial, which means that you probably should double check that you got this one covered. The details come from Simon Sucker Brown from the Saturday Initiative. And essentially the problem here is how the exchange front end and back end really sort of cooperate when it comes to authentication. The front end in exchange is the web server you usually connect to, but it's really sort of just a proxy that then calls the respective or forwards the request back to the respective endpoint at the exchange back end. Now, typically the front end is responsible for authentication, but there is a special delegated authentication mode where the front end basically states that the back and should take care of authentication. And this is indicated with a simple cookie. Security token is the name of the cookie. And as long as that cookie is present, doesn't matter what's the value, the backend should be responsible for authentication. But that is not always happening. And the end result is that an attacker is able uh, to send opt requests to reconfigure a user's exchange account. The total attack really just requires two requests. The first one is going to result in a 500 error because the attacker first needs a so-called canary. That 500 error does actually send that canary cookie back. So now the attacker has the canary cookie and can send the request with the security token. And the simple action attacker could perform here is, for example, modify an exchange mailbox configuration to add a new forwarder and with that of course being able uh, to listen in on any email being sent. Again the vulnerability was patched in April but only now did we learn about the details and how simple it is to exploit. And the lock file ransomware as described by Sophos does offer some new tricks in order to evade some standard anti-ransomware protection. 
Probably one of the most obvious things to look for if you're trying to detect ransomware is if files are all for a sudden being encrypted. And well, that's what Lockfile does as well. But instead of encrypting the entire file, it only encrypts alternate 16 bytes of a file. So first 16 bytes, the second 16 bytes is left alone, and then another 16 bytes. And with that, apparently, they're able to evade some of these defenses. The end result, of course, is that still most of your files are encrypted. And once the encryption finishes, the ransomware will also delete itself to make instant response a little bit more difficult. Well, that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.